Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to our virtual event space. So my name is Ali. I'm a bookstore at the LFP location. Now I'm your host for this evening. Uh, I'm so excited to be introducing Janice Lee and Jennifer Calkins here to discuss their books, Imagine a Death and Fugitive Assemblage. But before we get into the good stuff, I just want to quickly thank you all so very much for tuning in. As much as we miss having you all in the bookstore, it has been such a delight to expand this online program to connect readers and authors in a virtual space. So thank you all so much for tuning in and buying books. Your support is what makes all of this possible. So I will be linking books in the chat all evening, so it'll be super easy to go and find them. For those of you in the Seattle area, come on in. All three of our locations are open, or if uh, or you can place an order online and come pick them up in the store, or if you're not local, we of course do ship. And once again, we are so grateful for your support. Uh, while you're over on our website, I definitely encourage you to check out some of our other upcoming events. We have an exciting roster coming up in the next few months. And if you'd like to stay in touch with our community, you can sign up for our newsletter. It's a weekly update about events and exciting releases, our online book clubs, and of course, follow us on any of the major social media platforms. We are at Third Place Books for the quickest updates and recommendations, and we have a pretty good time over on our social media, so definitely go and see if there's anything there for you. Uh, speaking of social media, if you'd like to check out some of our past virtual events, you can find most of them on our YouTube channel, including this event within the next 48 hours. So if you'd like to see our other events or share this one, go ahead and track us down over there. Um, we are here for about an hour and towards the end, we will be taking questions. So if you have any questions, which we very much hope that you do, go ahead and leave those in the Q&A box, which should be either at the top or bottom of your screen. It is different than your chat box, which is great for virtual applause and connecting with each other. Uh, we would love to know where you're from, so go ahead and fill up that chat box. But when it comes time for questions, please do make sure those end up in the Q&A so we can most easily find them. Um, before we get started, I'd like to remind everyone of our commitment to ensuring the safety and well-being of event attendees and guest authors. So in our chat and question spaces, please do lead with kindness and refrain from any inappropriate behavior or harassment. Uh, there are auto-generated closed captions available from the menu at the top or bottom of your screen. Select the live transcript button to enable or disable them. Finally, should any technical issues arise, which this is the world of Zoom, it, it can happen, um, we will work as quickly as we can to resolve them, and we appreciate your patience and understanding. And I believe that that is all of my housekeeping. So without further ado, I am so thrilled to introduce the stars of the show. First, Janice Lee, the author of seven books of fiction, creative nonfiction, and poetry. Most recently, The Sky Isn't Blue, and our book of the evening, Imagine a Death, and Forthcoming Separation Anxiety. She is a, she's founder and executive editor of Entropy, co-founder of The Accomplices LLC, and an assistant professor of creative writing at Portland State University. Her most recent release, Imagine a Death, is about a slowly impending apocalypse and three people coming to terms with their past and its shadow. Our second author this evening is Jennifer Calkins, a writer, attorney, and evolutionary biologist. She is the author of Fugitive Assemblage, A Story of Witchery, and the chapbook Devil Card. Between 2010 and 2015, she produced The Quail Diaries, an interdisciplinary project melding sci science and lyric essay. Um, other recent creative works have been published in The Offing, Snail Trail Press, The Fanzine, Entropy, Queen Mob's Tea House and Quarterly West. Her newest book, Fugitive Assemblage, blends fiction and poetry as a woman drives through California wrestling with grief. So thank you both so very much for being here. I am so excited to listen in on this reading. If you need anything, of course, give me a shout. I will be listening. Same goes for all of you in the audience. I will be in the chat. And with that, I'm going to pass the stage to Jennifer, who's going to open us up with a reading. So welcome. Hello, everyone. Um, I am going to hide my self view so that I'm not watching myself read. Thank you all for coming. 
And I have a few things to say before I jump into reading some of the book and then closing it off with a little sonnet. Um, I am reading in Seattle um, on the ceded and unceded lands, past and present of the Duwamish and Coast Salish tribes. So I wanna recognize that and acknowledge that. And also I wanna acknowledge the other than human beings that are in the space with me and around me and welcome them, including my uh, geriatric rescue cockatiels and whatever uh, micro microbes that are inside of me and on top of me. Um, and then I also then want to say a little bit about the opportunity to read at Third Place Books. Just I'm really grateful. This is my neighborhood bookstore. The books behind me, I'm sure uh, quite a number of them came from Third Place Books. Um, and related to that, to thank my press, which is Third Thing Press, which feels like a natural linkage. And I'm so grateful to that it was third thing that produced this book because the book itself is a physically beautiful object. Um, and I'm really grateful for that. Finally, I wanna say how honored I feel to be able to read with Janice Lee, um, who is a, a fearless writer, uh, is, a, is really a central person, I think, in the literary world and in helping other writers and other artists bring their work into the world. Um, I, I, she's, she's incredibly generous. Uh, and then she's also sort of someone I look to for ways of being in the world that are imagining new worlds and, ima and thinking of the other beings in the world. Um, and so I'm really grateful to be able to be in this space, this virtual space with Janice um, and be able to read with her because um, first of all, I've started her, the book that she's going to be reading tonight. And it's, remarkable, um, but also just generally, her writing is is fearless and goes to places that I think are really necessary, but that are hard for writers to go to. So, all right, now I'm gonna move into talking a little bit about my writing and I'm gonna leave a little crumbs out there in case you wanna have a conversation. I'm gonna read a bit from this book and, uh, and then the poem I'm gonna read and both of them have the voices of other people. So the book has voices of people who range from the women who crossed and covered wagons to Robert Burton who wrote Anatomy of Melancholy. And one of the things I've realized with this book and with the work I've been doing lately with climate change is that I'm really doing a project that while it involves trying to be in the world with other beings. It also involves uh, sort of excavating the whiteness, the trauma of whiteness and my own situation as a white bodied person and what I carry into the world and, and how that affects the world around me um, in ways that I am only just understanding. And so that I think is really a big part of why these voices are, are central to the work I'm doing that they, they, I cannot leave them out of my writing in a way. So leaving that as a nugget, if you want to ask me more about it later, we can have that conversation. All right, so I'm going to move on and read a little bit from Fugitive Assemblage. Um, and I'm going to start in San Luis Obispo. So the main character dry, starts around Los Angeles pulls uh, an IV out of her arm, walks out of the hospital and starts driving north. Um, and and San, San Luis Obispo is one point at which she stops on this journey. And so as I read, you'll, start, you'll hear her in that place and then you'll hear her start to go somewhere else. San Luis Obispo town lies in a beautiful green grassy valley about nine miles from the sea. I shouldn't have stopped. I should have kept moving further inland on the 101 to Paso Robles, crossing over the 46 to the I-5. I'd passed the Harris Farm feedlots on my way and I could have slept in Fresno. I was near enough to Stockton, I could taste it. But I was too hungry to wait, so I parked at Taco Bell and bought myself a burrito. I apologize for my mail. The devil being a slender, incomprehensible spirit can easily insinuate our bowels. Our wagon is in the lead today. We'll be behind tomorrow. So now we are on the wing. Just beyond Osoflaco, the skinny bear, 
killed for food or what? I took my meal and sat outside. Last night, the world was changed by water, Balneum Diablo. Late afternoon and the sunlight was tilted. Strong shadows cut across the concrete benches and tables, stretching and extending, growing along fault lines from subduction to uplift, volcanism, there is an empire. As I ate, I watched the parking lot. A man pulled up on a Harley Davidson and parked next to my car. Blue bandana in his dirty blonde hair, jeans so filthy they seemed made of earthen boots. A shirt too, I'm sure, but I was too angry to notice. Oh, and I should have mentioned this is 1983, thus my Dotson. He dismounted and walked by the side of my little Dotson. She was helpless, and while he might have been just a slow moving sort of fellow, I was overcome with rage, my little reservoir. I tossed my trash, wiped my hands on my jeans, and marched over to my car, key in hand, held it like a weapon, ready to slice the air and him with it, using its dull pattern metal blade. It comes to pass that our generation is corrupt. A small log cabin and lean to without windows. This is the journey's end, verba sin, sine voce, words without speaking. As I walked by, that scruffy man looked at me and smiled, such a sweet smile, teeth broken on the left side. He confused me, so unguarded, and everyone should be on guard. A moment later, back in the driver's seat of my little car, I realized I was sweating, the sort of sweet stink that rises when one is afraid. Weak, both in body and mind, many feral diseases raging amongst us, crazed. My grandfather's brother, chemist, then union psychoanalyst, died in France, but this was after the estrangement. We've always been smart, but not always kind and quite often cruel. Some sort of heritage along with a melancholy and the other types of madness. Andean type, Japanese type, Atlantic type, California type. We offer love with one hand while we ready the other to hold you underwater. If it is love that injures, how can we heal? Sitting there, I thought of dusty feet and the sight of the water sinking into the earth, water, the idea of drowning, the fact of my grandmother body surfing seven months pregnant. Is there meaning? Buried metal rising like boils on the skin, the pathetic sign of two sticks tied together in the shape of a cross next to a horse's decomposing corpse. The teeth bared, even though the creature was always so gentle in life. All my anger drained, that smiling had diffused me, and all I could do was weep or curse. Fuck it, I said. I turned the car on and nosed back into the freeway. The distance from New Orleans to Chagres is 1,500 miles. Take your baggage at once to the custom house, then hurry out of the village that is pestilential. The ocean lust is a family thing. Maybe not the idea of drowning as a solution, but the salty water, salty blood, thirst, hunger, the sight of bones versus seasickness. I kept bleeding. I was gonna drive north until direction reversed itself. All right, I think I'm gonna stop there and move on to my little sonnet. Just to close off, this is part of a project that I'm working on with Anne Markin, um, which is really a project of trying to come to terms with climate change or not come to terms because it's not possible, but be in it, experience it and engage it. And I've been, for this, the voices that are coming in include transcripts from witch trials in Europe and Salem, transcripts from people writing about insanity, which is a word that we can talk about, and, and other texts, but those are really some of the core texts that are coming through in this. And this is a sonnet, oh, and I should say the other text is my legal paper that I have published in um, when I was a law student. So it pulls from my legal analysis of the Paris Agreement. And I'm reading it in part because in November, COP26 happens, and this is the big Paris Agreement meeting. So I've I feel like I have to tell everyone about it, so I'm going to tell you through a poem. All right, so this starts, uh, the title is A Flame, the Wildfire as Though the God. 
a flame, the wildfire as though the God I sought were there, sparking the rocky path, urging a blaze to the woods, hemlock shod. What doubly layered question, this wild wrath, God's notion. Only the ghosts of the pines remain, a murder or injury by these means. The lightning, the arson confines of that deity passing over my whole body. Upon returning, I knew the air that had once raced towards me in waves of wind created by fire, leaves that flew about like butterflies, the ashy graves, the roaring forests, overwooded, maimed. I am always and ever licked by flame. So with that cheerful ending, I'm gonna hand it off to Janice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jen. Um, so thank you to Third Place Books. Um, thank you for everyone who's here. Um, and thank you again, Jen, for um, you know putting this together and for reaching out. And um, I'm just really happy to be doing this with you and in conversation with you. Um, I just want to you know echo again that her book is so good. I have it here also. Um, so I'm just a very big fan. Um, so I'm reading from Imagine a Death today, um, which is the new novel that is out. And I'll just say a few things. It's it's about a lot of different entangled themes, um, trauma and abuse and the climate and the environment, um, and uh, has both human protagonists and also non-human protagonists. But it's also just about the entanglement and assemblage of all of these things as well. Um, and I'm going to read just a few uh, short chapters from that. Um, and this first one is called The Birds. The Birds. Look at the word columbarium, which means something like an area in a garden or church where urns are held. Literally, though, pigeon house. If one goes there looking for pigeons, one doesn't find pigeons, first because the gate is always locked, especially in light of the numerous recent vandalisms, second because the pigeons turn out to be doves, much closer to greatness and metaphor than pigeons, third because the pigeon makes a home anywhere and doesn't want a house in a garden, or at least a garden that is considered to be such and called a garden, rather than the miserable and ragged roof that they are more accustomed to. If someone asked you what was the most impressive animal event you've seen, you might give one of the following answers. That you once watched a pigeon grooming itself in a lit green traffic light, and when the light turned from green to red, you lost the bird in shadow dioramic. That you once saw a deer that an eagle had placed on a power line, except you didn't see this yourself, only heard about it from a slightly less than reliable source, and you had so much trouble picturing the escapade that you had to research the weight an eagle might be able to hold while flying. That you once came across two snakes writhing in agony or pleasure on the path in front of you, and you weren't sure whether to be frightened by the sight or aroused, and then when you felt a stir between your legs quickly turned your thoughts into fears. That you once saw a full-grown bear steal a pie off of a window ledge, except you didn't really see this yourself, only read it in a book or glimpsed it in a movie, perhaps. Even after they tore off the soffit and yanked out the planks from under the church roof, even after they bulldozed through the nave, the pigeons didn't leave. There hadn't been any reason to take the church apart. The church had been a fixture, though forlorn and unaware. It had stood for countless years, even after the fire almost a decade ago, which hadn't taken any lives but had contributed to the loss of face after a desert saint had appeared in a dream of one of the parishioners and had warned of the corruption of the church, the fire being the final evidence of the saying, karma is a bitch. The pigeons had claimed it as their sanctuary, but perhaps something about safety codes or the density of pigeons or a stalled development contract had prompted the sloppy and cruel demolition project. The pigeons didn't leave after all that, even though there wasn't any room for them. Their nests had been destroyed and there was barely enough room for them to huddle side by side, the pigeons trying to hold each other awkwardly in the rain, wings flapping and clumsy without arms, trying to stick together in the grueling heat, the warmth of the sun coupled with the warmth of the reflecting concrete. 
People started to notice, though, that the pigeons seemed to have lost their will to live. Were they depressed, they wondered. Did pigeons get depressed? It seemed logical that they could easily uproot and move, simply fly away and find a new place to roost in the vastness of this gradually emptying city. Some of the citizens of the city felt sorry for the pigeons, brought them sunflower seeds, tried to lure them into the park where there was lots of prime trees for roosting, even tried to bring them home with them to keep as pets. But instead, the pigeons wandered out into the middle of busy streets and waited for oncoming cars to hit them. They wanted to get hit, and they learned how to get hit more efficiently. If they stumbled out onto the road too early, the cars would swerve out of the way, the preservation of life and instinctual reflex in the drivers, so the pigeons learned to wobble out onto the road when the cars were already a few hundred feet away. And in that flash of time in which they waited for death, they knew not to expect redemption or light, and instead forgave themselves. And they knew not to expect anything on the other side, and so instead savored the taste of the last sunflower seed they had digested from earlier in the day, beak slightly ajar, ready, conditional, final. Two, there were those pigeons that didn't await deaths in oncoming traffic and simply starved to death, refusing to leave the church or to even fly the short distance down to the sidewalk where mountains of sunflower seeds had piled up in homage to the pigeons. When their bodies had given out, they dropped to the ground, the bodies of dead pigeons piling up next to the piles of sunflower seeds. Generations of blasphemous beings, sinful creatures that allow pigeons to fall from the sky. One man wondered, what is to come next? That same man who lived very close to the pigeons and who used to find comfort in the warbling cooing of the pigeons, the constant and sweeping cooing of the pigeons that reverberated subtly and predictably that allowed him to linger more comfortably in the petrified stillness of mourning, to inspect the eternity of silence, to be unbothered by the color of the sky while having his tea on the balcony, mourned the loss of that comforting sound that had bolstered his environment for so long. And without knowing the trajectory or intention of the pigeons themselves, wandered out into the street one night when the fog was particularly dense and the sky particularly low, and allowed himself to be hit by a truck manned by a particularly inattentive driver. He did not die instantly, though the impact was loud and decisive, and he did not die the next morning when one newspaper reported the incident, perhaps due to lack of funds or newly composed laziness as journalism was no longer a profession but a hobby, and newspapers were hardly read but rather used to swat flies or roaches. Without even first calling the hospital to inquire on the status of the victim and printed the headline, Pigeon Loving Man Joins the Birds in Deaths After Fatal Traffic Collision. The following week, he was still not dead, but was sleeping rather peacefully, and when the doctors decided he was in a coma with no easy way to predict whether he would wake up, moved him to the terminal ward in the basement and sent out a very sloppy notice to the same local newspaper inquiring whether the man had any living family members or friends who might come to his aid. The notice was printed the same morning as a fire at an elementary school, though regardless, the man had no family, and even the neighbors couldn't recall his name. On his way to school, a little boy saw a strange sight, 47 pigeons falling from the sky. He walked over to one of the mutilated pigeons on the ground and thought that it seemed to be glowing green, unnaturally so, almost neon or fluorescent, but too, he was colorblind, and most of all, the color reminded him of the color on his jeans when he tripped and fell in the grass, and the juices of the crushed blades bled onto his pants. He wasn't as disturbed by the sight as he probably should have been, and thought instead that maybe this could be something interesting for show and tell at school that morning, and that this was definitely a better crowd pleaser than the old photograph of his grandfather, a general, and also generally considered hero of a great war that his mother had found in the attic for him. He picked up one of the intact bodies and stuffed it into his backpack. Then, noticing the time, sprinted off in the direction of school.
Um, this next short one is the dog. And I felt like I had to read this one because we were just talking about our dogs before the reading. And this is from the point of view of the dog. There is the veering in my nostrils. It's a season of deaths and resurrection, but what season isn't? She veers, is veering, but if she misses anybody, it is the ghost that becomes an intimate confidence. I wish she could understand how gracefully we can slide into the images of dirt here, that the mountains speak, but she cannot hear them. We are all veering constantly, and to be alone doesn't mean to be dejected, but still with each other. She lives by mirages, but realizing that the mirages and the everything else are becoming each other constantly, and that her reflection is constantly becoming her, just as she is constantly becoming her reflection. There are certain things I have become accustomed to. I don't know why I bite. I don't miss anybody because I don't know how, but I know what I am attached to, and that is everything. Who ever said it was easy to understand their real self? A dog, probably, but at least this is a wonderful place to be unhappy in. Um, it's nice timing that my neighbor's dog was just barking. So I'm going to close... Um, with this last chapter called The Whales. Um, and The Whales, um, this is dedicated to um, J35, also known as Taliqua. Um, and it's also dedicated to the humpback whales of the Star Trek movie, um, A Journey Home. What is the pattern of predictable sounds that, in its steadfast refusal to cooperate with its interpreters, shakes you at your chest, wraps its oral tendrils around your waist, and asks, what do you see in your future? She was seized by the fullness of survival, and as the last boat sped past, she gritted her teeth and shouldered her body next to her mother's, seams of space closed off by flesh, and as the water began to clear, she was able to see again. She scooted up to look into her mother's eyes, and the eyes let her know they had seen everything they needed to see, or there had been nothing to see at all. They had, in the past days, seen many of their friends disappear or leave, any insistence on coalition heard silence, and there were less and less tiny things to swallow up, less and less places to hide large bodies from those that lurked in the shadows above the shadows, so that swimming to the surface to watch the dust dancing in the sun was no longer a relished pastime. Her mother had tried to remain connected with the others, but they were afraid that her visions had been a bad omen that there were so few of them now because of what she had seen that they would better fend for themselves far away from her connection with the kingdom of the dead. She had now known that before her there had been another who had died before even seeing the sky, and that her mother had carried that other upon her back for several days, the others urging her to let go. But how does one let go of everything? How does one simply allow for such finality when it is a piece of you that must be discarded and dropped into the sea? I won't pass this on to you, I promise, her mother would whisper every evening. Especially on full moons, she would watch her mother's eyes cloud over, tongue tucked back and voiceless, but water running along the contour of her massive body and her mother would hum as the moonlight rode over her skin, and when her eyes cleared like the water and when she spoke again, it was always the same. She didn't want to confess to her mother that she had started to feel the shudders too, that sometimes during the rainstorms she could feel a tiny voice like a grain of rice trying to reach her lips, her resistance making the voice more insistent. And though she wasn't afraid, she didn't want to worry her mother. Her mother knew enough deaths, had enough ghosts following her, hated knowing the fate and endangerment of their kind, but without the others, could do nothing about it except to sing. That eerie melody that carried through the water and over the surface, through air currents and upward into the atmosphere, 
the kind of melody that human composers strove for years to construct, but here it poured out of her. More than just a song, but a lament, an intimate tether to all other forms of life, a resonance that even the pigeons with their blank stares roosting on telephone wires would feel, but perhaps not be able to parse, yet this wasn't a sound to be parsed out or interpreted. It was meant to be heard and received and felt and transposed into tears or waves or touch, the openness of a broken heart. Another day ended and the light bounced off of the trembling surface, two whales bobbing under the starlight. I like the night up here, she said. We can see the stars. They are not our stars, her mother responded. Both knew more than they let on to the other, and when the blue of the night finally ran out, they awoke to another boat passing overhead. She didn't know why, but this time, instead of swimming deeper and hiding, she had a feeling penetrate and a voice that ebbed inside her like the tide, and so, in a flurry, she turned to her mother and only whispered, don't worry, as she swam upward to meet the dangling hand slowly slicing the water. The hand connected to a little girl was gentle. The little whale jumped up and the girl beamed in excitement, though the girl wasn't alone. There were two men with her, each with various recording devices and other equipment, and they spoke words to each other and the girl responded. And as more lights turned on, the girl leaned into the water, put her hand on the whale again and said simply, don't worry. The whale bobbed there for a moment longer, the girl's hand still resting gently on her head. And when the girl finally removed her hand, the little whale ducked her head underneath the water and returned to find her mother. That night, the girl and the men could hear the whales singing. They are singing to save the world, the entire world, she would say. And the men with their fragile devices and advanced machines would record the music and nod in agreement but say nothing, just nodding from time to time as the songs would create spikes of different heights on their screens, all of the lamentations of two grieving souls seeking intimacy articulated in the rise and fall of jagged black lines. And somewhere out there, the whales would swim and sing because they were alone but with each other, a reminder that loss and exile are linked, and the sound was a way to stay connected with the movement of their bodies through the water and the air and the sky and the tremblings of the earth and the breaths of all the living beings. And that night, there were more lights in the sky, even more stars being born, and an unanswerable tether to time. And I will finish there. Thank you. I'm going to just hop in and, and say um, the, the applause that you can't hear from the audience. <laughs> that was beautiful. Thank you both so much. Um, I think I'm going to let you two ask each other a couple of questions at this point. Um, author or audience members, if you have any questions, now is definitely the time. Go ahead and throw those in the Q&A. We would love to hear from you. So I'm going to pass this back to our authors. Thank you both. Thank you. That was beautiful, Janice. Um, and I do have some questions. So if you want me, I can throw some out at you first if that works. Sure. Unless audience members have questions, you can, you know, uh, Ask AMA, ask me anything, ask us anything, AUA. Um, so I have sort of an unformed question, but I, I think maybe it will um, be a platform to talk about because one of the things I, you know, I'm really grateful is that you read some of these passages about the other than human, um, but also, you know, really this illustrated what you were talking about in terms of entanglement, which is you're doing so effectively here with, you know, like with the pigeons where you go from the pigeons to the human, you know, to the very human roles in the mm -hmm. hospital and the journal, like it, it's just this remarkable entanglement. 
part of what I'm interested in is sort of your feeling and experience of navigating with the other than human world. Um, you know, and how, yeah, like, are, are there ways that you think about doing that work as an author? Do, are there sort of concrete approaches to it? Does it come to you more as sort of an embodiment? Um, so I'll stop talking. Yeah, it's a good question. And I want to ask you that too, because of your work um, as an evolutionary biologist as well. But um, yeah, I think, um, and it's funny because as I've been reading from this book from the past couple of weeks, I actually have been reading mostly the animal and plant parts, even though the humans do take up the most space. Um, you know, I want to decenter the humans and because their chapters are the longest, they're not as fun to read out loud um, practically. But yeah, this the other than human, I mean, I feel like um, for the past, you know, several years, a lot of my practice, both my writing practice, but my spiritual practice as well has been a lot of just sitting and listening. And so even things like gardening, I have um, a chapter that was inspired by the pea plants that I was growing in my garden and just communicating with them and being really surprised by how much the plants actually respond. And I had been reading a lot of like, you know, um, academic and science papers about like how intelligent plants are. And I was like, well, of course they're intelligent. I didn't need the science to tell me that, but it was still surprising to have these encounters where, you know, as a human, I take for granted that we speak in language and that we can understand each other. And also we don't always understand each other as humans either, right? And those are the kinds of encounters that are really interesting to me, all the non-language encounters we have with each other, um, with humans as well as non-humans. And so I think in here, I was really thinking about that, like how are all of the ways that we relate to each other um, outside of language as well, um, which is actually most of the time, um, right? But we articulate everything in language and we focus on the language-based communication even though that's not actually the most important or at least most prevalent. Um, and that's something that I've been thinking about, but I'd love to hear like your thoughts on this question too, because I just, you know, I think about all your work with like quails and, and um, yeah, I just, <laughs> I think you're still muted, Jen. I have done that so much this week. I apologize. So I, I do, I think one of the things you're talking about that I do want to note is this the language piece of it um and that was something that was happening in your reading like the no, the non-language stuff but also you know so much of what we're doing now is on zoom and that is one of the place where it just becomes hyper focused on language and i hadn't really thought about that as part of what the experience is but that I know we've talked, you know, I've heard like we've lost all the nonverbal cues and stuff, but it's really the way you're talking about everything that happens that is not verbal. It, it's such a huge component of it. Um, and then I guess with the, yeah, so the, it's, I have a very specific answer with sort of this, especially with the climate project um, for what I've been doing, which is after I finished Fugitive Assemblage, I started working on a project of only, the only time I ever write about an other than human being, it's gotta be one that I've encountered. And so I've been, because I want, I'm trying to experience plants and other animals and invertebrates as wholly embodied beings in their own right as a, and, and so, and that's been a little bit complicated. It necessarily limits who I'm writing about. Um, and then at the same time, I'm having to learn botany, which I suck at. Um, and so I'm trying, you know, who is this tree that I'm interacting with? And then the trouble of like ferns, like I don't, I'm not very good at recognizing different individual ferns as I'm hiking. So anyway, that's one answer. Um, and I think just more generally, um, it has been a challenge that I've been thinking about, you know, ever since I was a, a biologist and realized that with a quail, there was a wall that I ran into that was a wall of not knowing what the quail was perceiving and not being able to measure it, but, but imposing measurement on the quail. 
and that there, there wasn't kind of that spaciousness in the research that I was trying to do to allow for what I was trying to understand about what was going on with them. And I will say, you know, now I'm in uh, doing law, which is um, all human, like the, the concept of the other than he, like, and even all humans barely enter into the frame. So it's a, it, it, it's a very weird tension um, that I'm dealing with, I guess, not very well or well, I don't know. But yeah, it's a good question. It's just, and it's something I think about all the time. Um, yeah. Um, it looks, there's a question uh, from Anne. Um, I can read it. So um, Anne asks, I'm curious about how you each use language to mediate process. The live despair you are also writing about. Maybe this is a question about the relationship of emotional restraint and embodiment in literary process. Also interested in the difference between anthropomorphism and anthropocentrism in your work. It's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to go first? Um, I can. I'm trying to formulate some thoughts. Um, so the language and, and mediating part. Um, I mean, yes, I, it's interesting because I'm really interested in all the stuff that language isn't, and yet this book is very language heavy. It's about excess of language, right? And for me, that's really about failure of language. Like there's so much language because language is constantly failing, um, which is actually what's interesting about it to me. Um, and so it's like this process of uh, reaching or grasping and um, the excess is enacting something that I think, um, you know, uh, kind of can't be achieved with a regular, you know, short, concise sentence that might already have something that it's pointing to, right? That, that there's already an index that's been established um, and that has an expected kind of destination. And, and I think what I, I'm trying to do with my meandering and with my excess is to allow for all of everything that it kind of continue, you know, everything that's part of that continuum to be included, um, which is potentially a lot and very messy. Um, and that's kind of the entanglement that I'm thinking about. Um, but if it's this question about despair, this is a lot of questions in one, um, <laughs> you know, um, I mean, I don't know if I have any emotional restraint, at least for this book. Um, this is not the book I set out to write. I, thought I was going to write a book that I had many plans and I had questions and I had done research and that book never ended up coming out. I didn't think I was going to write a book about trauma and abuse. Um, I definitely did not think any of my own personal stuff was going to leak into the book and it all did. And it just sort of kind of poured out. I mean, I use this analogy of like vomiting, um, but it really <laughs> did feel like I vomited this book out. And then instead of like, you know, flushing the toilet, which is like what you would normally do is I just like, you know, was like looking through it and like analyzing the vomit. And that's actually what, what the book, um, what the book is. Um, and then the last part of the question, um, I'll just say briefly, you know, a book that I, uh, read, you know, I can't even remember if I read it during this book or afterwards, but it did help my, help shape my thinking about it is, um, it's Being a Beast by Charles Foster, um, and he, you know, um, I mean, it's an interesting book. The vantage point is like, you know, basically it's this like white male um, hunter who becomes a vegan and then decides to like embody all these points of views of animals. Um, but I found it really interesting because he's like critiquing this like way that we anthropomorphize um, animals. And so his way of going about it is like, well, I'm going to live as a badger for a few months. I'm going to bring my son. We're going to chew worms and we're going to like live in the dirt. Um, so I'm not like quite that extreme, but I found that really interesting because it did make me think about vantage point, not just as a vantage point of like consciousness, right. And of language, like, oh, we can't ever know, um, you know, these other vantage points, which is partially true, but it also made me think about like physical vantage points, like a badger is really low to the ground and that is incredibly, you know, so that's like something that we can experience. Um, and it just made me think about the distance and intimacy 
between humans and animals, but actually just between human and human as well. Um, like we take for granted that we can understand other humans because we're the same species. And I don't think that that's actually true. Like, I think it's as hard to understand some humans as it is to understand trees <laughs> sometimes. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think that's, that's back to the, the language mediating question, but yeah. What do you think, Jen? So, um, I do want to note that it's interesting that your process felt like this, this huge, you know, because it, it doesn't read like, it, it doesn't read like something vomited up and then sh shaped. I mean, it really, it reads, but I, I get that feel. Like, I always think of my way of writing is just throwing a bunch of, you know, it's just, I, I tend to write with a bunch of stuff just coming out and then I have to like, is there anything in here? Um, especially with fugitive assemblage, actually, which was a, um, compul it was a compulsive project. Um, and so language to mediate um, process. Um, I mean, I, I've used it in different ways in, uh, in, in the things I've read today. So the fugitive assemblage piece of it, um, the way I use language is that I had a very clear, sparse narrative structure, but then I, um, and so the real narration is, it's not a lot of pages of actually me telling the story of her. And then I had these other voices coming in and I basically layered these voices onto each other. And, and I, I feel like this happens, and it's hap this does happen with the climate poetry as well. There's something that kind of sparks as I put my writing against some of these other writing uh, pieces of writing, or as I, you know, as I layer them into each other. And so um, what I find is that there's an emergent, something emergent that comes out of it. And so it's really this taking my own language, but, but then placing it against all these other ways of using language that is sort of the mediation, I guess, of the process is that that's really where something emerges for me. Um, and yeah, emotional restraint versus embodiment. With fugitive assemblage, my goal was actually to create a sense of emotion. So how, it was all about how can I make this be about feeling as opposed to a story. Um, and so I don't know, I, yeah, I don't know about emotional restraint. I mean, it, it's interesting because I was thinking about that in terms of your book, because your, your book, there is so much emotion in it, but it, it's not the overwrought emotion that then negates emotion in the reader in a way. I can't really articulate that, except that the, you know, there's a way that people try to write emotional language and it doesn't actually get to the physical experience of the emotion. And so I think that that was what I was thinking about with fugitive assemblage. I don't, I want the emotion in people's bodies. And, and, I, and I feel like you're doing that as well in your work. And there is a restraint there. Um, and that at least it, it reads like you're not succumbing to some kind of, um, use of overwrought language. And I will say, you know, in the lot more, like I, this makes me think about legal briefing, which now everyone's going to be super annoyed at me, but there, you know, it's something I've thought about, you know, in terms of if you're trying to make an argument, you see lawyers are either very kind of restrained in their language use, but there's also a lot of overwrought shit. And some of this, excuse me for swearing, but some of this stuff is just, you know, writing about justice broadly is not actually the thing. And so I think that's the emotional restraint in a way. I mean, I'm, I don't know if that's what Anne meant, but it is what I think about. And then uh, anthropomorphism and anthropocentrism. Um, I feel like I'm struggling with that a lot because I, I feel like I really wanted the rest of the world in fugitive assemblage and it's there in ways, but it still is very much centered in the human experience. Um, with the climate work, I think that's what I'm intentionally am trying to do now with the project of only allowing myself to, oops, there's Suki, 
only allowing myself to bring in beings that I've interacted with and always making sure those beings are in the work in some way, I guess, so that it's never just the human, but it's not it's always these other beings that I've had personal experience of so that I'm learning about them and thinking about them and, and their body is with me. So. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? I have a quick question. So this is gonna be kind of a last call for questions audience members. So if you have anything else you'd like to ask, now is the time. Um, but a question I always love to ask authors um, is what was the best day? What was your best day while working on this book? And what was your <laughs> hardest day? Um, I can't even remember, like, like my days are all blurred together. Um, like I can't even remember when I worked on this. Um, what I can share this is that this is, doesn't really answer the question, but like a day that I do remember is um, there was a day that I was writing a scene in this book, um, and it was uh, the photographer was throwing away a painting that he didn't like, but his grandma had kept it, and now his grandma had passed away, so he could finally throw it away. And it's based on a real painting that my sister owned that we only kept because my uh, mother really liked it. And even after she passed away, I kept it because I felt like I wanted to hold on to it. So the day that we that I wrote the scene, the middle of the night, the next night, um, that painting fell onto the ground in the hallway and like the glass shattered everywhere. Um, and my sister came and we all came out because we we're like, what was that? And, you know, it just, it just fell on the ground and... Um, my sister was very excited to finally be able to throw away um, <laughs> that painting. And I just remember that because it was a strange, um, I don't even know what to call that. It's not really synchronicity. It's just like, um, you know, I wrote it and then this this event happened out of nowhere. And um, it made me much more careful about what I, or at least thinking about like how um, the world influence each other. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to come uh, actually jump off of that because I also, I, I, I remember there were moments when I was like, uh, uh, things I wrote made me laugh. Um, and so that, you know, th those were nice moments when I was actually laughing because something I'd done made me, it was like, what the fuck was that? Excuse me again for swearing. But then, um, there were, it was, my book was a pretty, it was a book that when I went and revived, it made me feel physically ill to work on it. Um, so there were a lot of days like that, but I, you know, I've had this weird thing happen where that book was really, my grandfather was in my mind a lot when I was writing that book. And the week that I finished the manuscript, he died. Um, and and then, and you know, er, this is going to seem wild to everybody, but then, you know, the oh. most recent book that Anne and I, the manuscript we finished, had my dog in it a lot, not as a character, but as a spirit, because she was with me hiking um, throughout working on that. And she was very much here. And she died right around when I finished that book. So in terms of thinking about how to be very careful, um, you know, I told my kids that my son said, well, you just need to start writing a manuscript about someone and never finish it. And so I'm thinking about, okay, so how does that work? But yeah, it, it's interesting, you know, your story about the, the painting falling, like it feels very much the same kind of how do these books operate in the, like in the world. Um, yeah, and, and it's funny because I had a friend who gave me kind of similar advice, like after I told her about that incident, she's like, well, what would it be like? Because then I mostly write about dark subjects, right? She's like, well, what would it be like if your next book, you only wrote about what you want to manifest in the world, <laughs> right? You know, yeah. which is actually a great prompt. And I was like, I don't know if I know how to do that, but I love the idea of it, right? Um, yeah. And so I have to, I have to sit with that, but, but that seems like, you know, what if we all wrote what we want to actually manifest in the right. world rather than everything that's haunting us? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that is, it's a very good prompt. 
Um, I am going to think about that. And I do think about, I, I know we're running up against time, but one of the things that I like about sort of you, you being in the world and the way you are in the world is I, part of what I'm trying to understand are new worlds that we're trying to come into. And, and that, that does feel like the hopeful piece. Like that's the piece of, we are addressing trauma and we are addressing grief. But I think part of the project of that is the project of, of creating these new worlds that we absolutely have to be doing. Um, and so I'm really grateful for you to be doing that. And I'm, I'm glad to have this new prompt. So I got the write the thing that about someone, he probably wants me to write about him and never stop writing about him, which is fine. <laughs> I, I would love to keep him alive through my manuscript, but I think also what we want to manifest. Um, I love that. Yeah. You two absolutely win the answer to that question. That was, <laughs> that was so good. <laughs> <laughs> all right so we have come to the end of our time together i think so we're about to call it an evening um i'm just going to take this last moment to say a huge thank you to both of you for being here and for sharing these words with us i so appreciated it i'm sure the audience did as well and if the chat is anything is any reflection of how they're feeling i think Success all around. So thank you, thank you so much. Um, audience members, one more huge thank you for turning out. Uh, we're so, so happy to have you here. For anyone who'd like to get your hands on copies of Imagine a Death and Fugitive Assemblage, go ahead and scroll up. There are links in chat. I'm just gonna give you a couple of seconds to keep an eye on that. Um, if you are local, of course, come on in and grab a copy. Uh, if you're not local, uh, we do ship once again. And I think that this is where we say goodnight. So if, if you let us know what you thought of this event, either in person or on social media, we always, always love to hear you. And Janice and Jennifer, one more huge, huge thank you for this reading tonight. And I think that this is where we awkwardly wave. <laughs> thank you. Thank you both. Thank you so much. Good night, Bye. everyone.